so now I'm going to go to um, um, a review of finite difference methods. All right, um, you know the last two lectures have hit you with a whole lot of new stuff, um, and I I want to step back. You know here in notes twenty five, page one hundred one. I want to step back and and uh, you know kind of explain things again. Okay, so we just made this. You know, we just made this uh, uh, in, in the last you know half an hour. We've made a, a leap into uh, 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 solving a tridiagonal system uh, using this uh, incredibly heuristic method for um, uh, for heat flow, and then we made another leap. And said that it also applies to extrapolation. Okay, and so now I, I'd better I'd better explain what uh, what we're looking at here and, and write it down for you. <clears throat> okay, so we have uh, an explicit. We we're going to talk first about the explicit finite difference methods and review what we've got. So we have either heat flow or uh, you know one D heat flow or a fifteen degree paraxial extrapolation equation. Uh, here uh, first is the uh, heat flow equation, okay? Uh, dQ dt, the subscript is now a uh, uh, partial derivative. dQ dt is equal to this r constant times d squared q dx squared, okay? And um, for heat flow, r is real and it's uh, uh, the transmissivity over the heat capacity, uh, sigma over c. Okay, for wave extrapolation, instead of t, we go to z. Okay, just substitute it there, uh, and uh, r is uh, is imaginary, complex. It's it's uh, imaginary. You know, the actual time is transformed to a retarded uh, omega prime, um, and then I'm going to drop the primes. Okay, so we have this uh, the 15 degree equation in retarded uh, retarded time is. Um, uh, is is only two terms, okay, and we're leaving it in terms of omega. So uh, there's only two derivatives still, and we have dQ dz is equal to minus i times v over two omega times d squared q dx squared, okay. So our imaginary r, which of course involves the velocity and the and the frequency, okay, that's doing all the wave. Ex Wave propagation for us, okay. <clears throat> um, you know, and we know the the level of, of approximation that we made. I mean, this this fifteen degree extrapolation equation was was developed from uh, the uh, full circular or semicircular uh, dispersion relation. You know, with a fifteen degree approximation, you know, via the uh, the Muir square root approximation, and um, and it ends up, you know, pretty much being exactly the uh, uh, the heat flow equation. Okay, and the, for extrapolation, we're 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 evolving in z, which is what we want to do. We want to downward continue, right? And uh, uh, and for heat flow, we're evolving in time t. Otherwise, same equation. Okay, we have two. Um, uh, I explained two. Um, Explicit finite difference methods. Okay, so uh, uh, essentially it's this uh, you know same equation here. Um, you know whether it's t or, or z, uh, we can we can uh, work on that. Uh, the r, you know, I'll just leave as r. You know, for heat flow, it's real. For extrapolation, it's imaginary. And um, the simple Euler difference, you know, is a uh, is a one step uh, uh, centered at uh, uh, at t plus half at x, okay, uh, on the left hand side for the the time derivative for the the x difference, it's centered at uh, t and x, okay. This is the simplest possible way. Um, we have to combine with r here. Uh, uh, our, our our alpha is going to be equal delta to delta t over uh, delta x squared times r, whatever it is. Um, and uh, uh, of course, if we're doing extrapolation, it's going to be delta z instead of uh, instead of delta t. Okay. Um, 
and the uh, uh, the shape of the star is this uh, sort of uh, flat T shape. Okay. Um, I don't know these aren't all um, um, you know from that uh, that uh, you know block uh, falling game uh, um, Tetris. Tetris. Yeah, these are not all Tetris shapes. Um, okay, and in fact, uh, yeah, you'd have to have some pretty funny centering to to get all the Tetris shapes. But maybe that should be investigated. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, just by doing the centering a little bit differently, wanting to center the left hand side with a with a two uh, interval uh, uh, time di difference, uh, we get the leapfrog difference. The right hand side is uh, pretty much the same, um, and the uh, but the centering is different, uh, and we have a five element um, differencing star instead of a four element differencing star. Um, you know, still our unknown is is at the next t or z level, t plus one, and uh, we have to re we have to keep around an additional uh, uh, previous time level. Uh, now, uh, you'll find that the leapfrog difference is uh, is unstable when you try it. Uh, you know, in in uh, lab seven, you'll see that it blows up. Doesn't give you a nice uh, you know diffusion of heat. It 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 suddenly you know Instead of a nice, uh, you start with a step in, in temperature, and uh, instead of uh, broadening and even, evening out, uh, it goes, uh, uh, you know, even for heat flow, it goes uh, wavy and, and then explodes. Um, and that's a pure numerical problem with the, uh, the difference and with the centering. So suppose on the right hand side, okay, notice that we have uh, 2 times q at x and t and calculating the x difference, the second x difference. Okay. Suppose that we, we approximate uh, uh, the, the q at x and t with the average of q at x and t plus 1 and, uh, the a and uh, with um, q at x and t minus 1. So we're going to kind of make that central, um, that central part leapfrog as well. This is called the, the defort frankel difference. This is not in the book. Um, this was looked at by uh, Ronan Lebra um, some years ago, but after the book. And um, um, this uh, creates a four element differencing star, which is all centered at x and t, but doesn't use that, you know, the coefficient. At, at q of x and of q, q at x and t is zero. Doesn't use that center element at all. How could that work? Um, but uh, uh, you know what you'll see is that actually it's pretty good. Uh, I'll, I'll show you that when we talk about stability. Um, the uh, the implicit method that uh, is the one that that uh, the our further extrapolation codes will use, especially in lab eight. Uh, it's called Crank Nicholson. And uh, it's we can use this in this case because we only have two, a two-dimensional space, uh, or uh, we can transform an additional dimension. Right? We have, you know, for heat flow, we have uh, uh, x and time. You know, we have uh, uh, space and you know one spatial dimension and, and time dimension. Um, and for our three-dimensional, uh, you know, right, x, z, and t, um, for our three-dimensional wave uh, uh, extrapolation. Uh, we can transform t to uh, omega, and and so reduce it then to uh, finite differencing over just uh, z and x. Okay, so uh, and, and and this works very nicely for extrapolation because velocity, right? I mean, we we can handle now with our with our finite differencing, we can handle velocity and any variation of x and z uh, theoretically at least. Okay, uh, but velocity doesn't vary with time, so the fact that we have time wrapped up into uh, frequency omega doesn't matter with the solution. Okay, we can still uh, you know have any velocity variation we like. Okay, so uh, the Crank Nicholson method you know basically involves taking that horizontal derivative twice, and that gives us this implicit you know two by three uh, six element differencing star. 
and uh, it's uh, all centered at uh, x and uh, t plus half. Okay, so that's our and and then we solve that you know for for the whole next t or z row at once uh, using the uh, Roy Greenfield's tridiagonal matrix solver. <clears throat> okay, now uh, let me let me just uh, start talking about how we assess you know which one of these methods is better than another. Okay, we've got issues of accuracy and stability. Okay. You know we are we're using an approximation, right? We're not taking the limit and letting delta t or delta z or delta x go to zero. You know our finite difference is an approximation to the true derivative, and and so the first logical question is how good of an approximation is it? How accurately are we actually computing those derivatives? Uh, and and when you look at uh, seismic wave modeling codes, you know this accuracy is a is a uh, is a big deal, you know. For instance, in the um, in our uh, um, in our uh, use of the of the second x derivative, right? It, it uses three elements to calculate the uh, second x uh, difference. That's called a second order solution for the uh, for the x x derivative. It, it only uses three elements. Uh, most wave propagation codes uh, want to be much more accurate. And so they're using fourth order or sixth order or even larger order uh, estimates for the uh, the x derivative. I'll, I'll show you how to calculate the order later on. Um, but you know, a fourth order code is going to instead of just using three elements to estimate the second derivative, it's going to use uh, five elements. Okay, sixth order is going to use a, a seven elements, and so forth. Okay. We're uh, we're really first order in uh, in our x in our time or z derivative because we only use two elements. Okay, and it turns out the more data that you use in each in each in estimating each each derivative, the more accurate you're going to be. Okay, now now once we have looked at the accuracy, we'll have some tools that that allow us to assess stability, which is why I had to add accuracy here before stability. Okay. And and we'll be able to say, okay, which, you know, why, why, you know, why did we go from the simple Crank Nicholson formula to, I'm sorry, from the simple Euler difference to the the more complicated, you know, more conceptually difficult um, Crank Nicholson implicit method? Why did why did we do that? Okay, the answer is in the stability. Okay, and the conditions that we we have to put on on make, having a stable calculation. All right. So uh, we're going to test the not the stability here, but the accuracy of a monochromatic solution at frequency at spatial frequency k. Okay, if our if our um, if our solution is going to blow up or become inaccurate for any particular value of k, you know, spatial frequency, then of course for real data, you know, our real data contain all kinds of different k's, all kinds of different frequencies, so it'll blow up for data. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about accuracy. Let's take this solution, this monochromatic solution. So uh, our wave field versus x is equal to some p zero times e to the i times k times x. Right? This is not k sub x. We just have you know our lateral k here. So it's uh, e times i times k times x. Okay. And uh, so of course uh, we have the Fourier dual. And I had to put the arrows on the equal sign here. You know, the second x derivative is uh, in the Fourier domain minus k squared times the wave field. Okay. Now this could be like the double difference operator, right? And here's uh, expressing the double difference operator a different way. You'll see later that I, I will call this double difference operator d sub x, right? That's a double difference operator in the x direction squared. Okay, that really is a square dx squared, big dx squared, is a double difference operator in x. Uh, applied to the wave field is the wave field at x plus delta x minus 2 times the, the wave field p at x plus the wave field p at x minus delta x divided by delta x squared. So uh, uh, you know whatever we have for, um, um, you know, when we do the, the real derivative, we get the real k, 
in the in the Fourier domain. When we do the double the 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 difference, the double difference, okay, that gives us an apparent k, a k hat, an approximated k. So our our question is then, you know, uh, if our if our double difference operator d sub x squared is going to approach you know, the operation of the second derivative, the second partial derivative, d squared dx squared, okay, then our k hat should approach k. How close do we get? That's the question. Okay, how close do we get? So we substitute the, uh, the wave field, the simple uh, wave field component into, um, uh, into the double difference operator, right? So we have, uh, and, and, then, and then we take it into the Fourier domain. So you know, d squared um, uh, p, right, on the left-hand side, that becomes our estimated k hat squared, minus k hat squared times the wave field, is equal to, uh, and, and we pull out, uh, you know, we're substituting in uh, p0 e to the i k times x, and we pull out p0, and we pull out uh, over uh, uh, 1 over uh, delta x squared, what we got in here is um, e to the i times k times uh, x plus delta x minus 2 times e to the i times k times x plus e to the i times k times the quantity x minus delta x. Okay, And then expanding each of these Euler exponentials, right? Um, we've got, um, and, and getting rid of the minus sign and, and, uh, and all that. Um, we can pull out e to the i k x, and then we have uh, in here left two minus cosine k times delta x minus i sine k times delta x minus cosine uh, of uh, minus k times delta x minus i sine times uh, minus i sine of minus k times delta x. Okay, and um, you know from this you can pull out. That uh, k hat squared times delta x squared is equal to two times one minus cosine of k times uh, delta x, and then we can use a half angle trig identity in here. And uh, so the relationship. Notice that this is the real k that we're you know they're both in purple. Sorry, but the k without a hat, the bald k is the real k. The uh, k hat is the is our estimate of k, right? So our estimate of k time, uh, times delta x is equal to 2 times the sine of k times delta x over 2. Now, this is, this is pretty weird, right? Because if, uh, if we had a really good estimate of k, then k hat would be equal to k. That would be it. Okay, But instead, we get this bizarre sign, all right? Now we only have to worry about the principal fold, right? From minus pi to pi. I mean, if we factor out, uh, uh, yeah, k times delta x, uh, we'll go from minus pi to pi, right? Of course, it's got this sign here, which is periodic. It's two times the sine of k times delta x over two, okay? And uh, so, so this, you know, this is a plot of the relationship. K hat equal to k would be right in here, right? At uh, at pi, it would be equal to pi. K hat would be equal to pi. But instead, at, at pi, at the Nyquist frequency, Nyquist spatial frequency, okay, instead of being equal to pi, it's equal to two. Okay, at uh, at minus pi, the negative Nyquist frequency, instead of being equal to, to minus pi, it's equal to minus two. So it's off by like thirty uh, percent, right? It's uh, it's it's not you know not too good. Maybe off by forty percent. Um. And the uh, um, now, now it's not so far off, right? The the slope of two times the sine is equal to uh, 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 is equal to uh, uh, to two here. So um, you know, at, at zero frequency, right? It's perfect. It's 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 absolutely perfect. And the divergence is at the higher spatial frequencies. Okay. So the uh, the finite difference uh, d squared. Is great for small k, you know, low spatial frequency, but it diverges at the Nyquist at higher spatial frequencies and becomes less accurate. So this is why, um, you know, this is why our, our our all of our finite difference calculations are limited in their spatial frequency. 
because we don't want that, that k hat to get too far from the true k. And once it starts happening, then, the, then our estimate of the derivative is, is going to be wrong. And you know, that's going to have some consequences. OK, I'll have to continue this um, uh, tomorrow. Tomorrow at 11, we'll, we'll meet. And, uh, and I'll continue. Now that we've defined accuracy of the horizontal derivative, we can go on and, and talk about stability in time for heat flow or depth for uh, wave extrapolation. So uh, we are still in notes 25, and I'm looking first at page 103, but I'll go pretty quickly to 104, um, because what I'm explaining is the accuracy of this second difference in x. You know, most of the wave propagation, the wave extrapolation equations, the finite difference solutions that we're going to use in this half of the class uh, they only have that second derivative in x. They don't have a third derivative in x. Uh, and uh, we compose them using this simple um, second order, uh, uh, this simple second order uh, difference. So a second order difference uses three different values, you know, p at x plus the wave field, uh, uh, at x plus delta x, the wave field at x, p at x, and p at x minus delta x. So that's three different values. And from that, it calculate you know this finite difference calculates the uh, this an estimate to the second derivative. Okay, so if we could do the true second derivative, we would get the real k without a hat. And doing the this finite difference, we get k hat. It's our estimate of the uh, of the second derivative. You know, in the Fourier domain, translated as a as a um, as a horizontal wave number, x direction wave number, and so we found that uh, the the accuracy goes like this uh, between um, pi and uh, uh, k delta x equal to uh, minus pi to pi. All right, we have a um, which is our principal fold. We have a relationship. Uh, between uh, the true wave number, which is the horizontal axis, and the um, effective uh, wave number, the estimated wave number, the k hat that we're, we're actually getting out of the finite difference, all right. And the purple sinusoid is our estimated wave number. Uh, the red dashed line would be our true uh, k if uh, k hat was perfectly accurate. So here at the Nyquist at pi, okay, at k delta x equals pi, which is the horizontal Nyquist frequency, then we ought to have uh, k hat equal to pi, but we don't. You know, through this equation, k hat equals two, okay, and that's um, that's the the uh, the degree of error that we get, okay. Um, at lower frequencies, you know, and especially at zero at zero frequency. We're perfectly accurate. There's no problem with this estimate. All right. So probably you would say, all right. At uh, it depends on on you know how many steps you have and the accuracy you need. But um, what we learned from this is that um, you know if we're um, you know we don't really have good accuracy until we're at like down below half of the Nyquist, the horizontal Nyquist, and if we're um, uh, most of our most of our um, um, you know most of most of our wave computation algorithms, uh, not wave extrapolations, but most of our wave wave modeling algorithms, you know they uh, they're not satisfied until they're essentially within the range of you know pi over ten, you know one tenth of the Nyquist frequency. Uh, there there are noticeable uh, artifacts. But with extrapolation, you know, there's not that much calculation, so we might we might do quite okay at uh, half of the horizontal Nyquist. All right. So now that we uh, now that we have that uh, that observation about the accuracy of our horizontal finite difference, we can continue and examine the stability. We're not we're not going to look. I mean, the the accuracy of our uh, of our first order uh, 
you know, either leapfrog or or um, uh, Euler finite difference in time or for extrapolation in z. Okay, um, the accuracy of that is is poorer. You know, it only uses the accuracy of that estimate of the uh, of the time uh, frequency of the uh, of the depth uh, frequency. That's that's even worse than it is for the horizontal because instead of having three values, there's only two. Okay, um, but what what happens here is that if if the accuracy is is too poor, then the calculation blows up, and that's the that's the way that we will maintain sufficient accuracy. Um, in our in our time direction finite differences, by observing when when the calculations blow up as we as we keep extrapolating waves to deeper and deeper level z's, or keep extrapolating heat flow to uh, further and further times t. So here's our, our simple uh, uh, equation. Either either heat well this is expressed as a heat flow equation. dQ dt is equal to r times d squared q dx squared, okay, and we Fourier transform over x. So now we've kind of isolated, and, and here's our here's our uh, our true k, okay. Uh, this is still a continuous equation with real derivatives here. So that's the true uh, horizontal wave number, and and we've isolated now our um, our time uh, derivative, okay. So now we finite difference that over time using Euler's method, right, which is centered at t plus half. So we have q at t plus one minus q at t over delta t, uh, and then it's equal to uh, you know we're going to leave it in the in the uh, uh, in the Fourier transform domain in x, right? It's in it's in the time domain, but in 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 the x uh, in the k uh, sub x domain essentially. We have minus r times now this has been finite differenced. It's k hat squared times q at t. So we we recognize here by by putting the hat on the k, we recognize that we are using that simple finite difference um, that simple finite difference uh, uh, in the x direction, the, the second the second uh, difference in x. Okay. So so now we have uh, k hat in there. We know what that is. Okay. So that's that's okay. Um, and we uh, we solve it for a relationship. We we take this equation here, this finite difference equation. We solve it for a relationship between q at t plus one, q at the next time step, and q at the current time step. And if we take the ratio between those two, then what we should have is an amplification factor. Okay. Now, if if that amplification factor you know, if we show some general relationship that that amplification factor is always greater than than one, right, either positive or negative, but it's if it's greater than one in magnitude, then as we proceed, you know, getting cues at, at larger and larger times or greater greater depths, you know, it's going to blow up. Okay, really, we want our amplification factor to be exactly one, right? Because we shouldn't be we shouldn't be losing energy out. Of our calculation, uh, but at least if, if it was less than one, then we would not um, uh, we would not have uh, uh, we wouldn't we, we it wouldn't blow up. It might not be quite physical, but it wouldn't blow up. So the amplification factor g we want to be equal to one, okay? And so I'm uh, here's and here's the amplification factor, and I'm going to take its absolute value, and I'm going to you know create this inequality here. Not really an equation, but an inequality, and so I want that absolute value to be less than one. Okay, so now I I, um, I, I need to express what I really mean by the uh, uh, you know by this um, um, by this absolute value, which means that minus one has to be less than or equal to uh, this one minus r delta t k hat squared. Which has to be less than equal to also has to be less than equal to one. So I got a triple. I got two inequalities here, strung together, and then so I can do a, you know there's certain kinds of algebra you can do on inequalities. So I add one to all terms, and I can do that without reversing the inequality. Uh, so I have zero is less than or equal to. Um, um, 
r delta t uh, k hat squared. What did I do? Did I? Uh, I should have added one, right? Is less than or equal to two. Um, I wonder if I made an error there. Let's see. So I wanted to. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. I I uh, I did reverse the equality because I multiplied everything by uh, uh, minus one and then uh, and then subtracted one. Okay. So uh, yeah, just I didn't show all the steps, but that should be two there. So you know, zero has to be less than or equal to r delta t k hat squared, which has to be less than or equal to two. And so now. Um, uh, what we can express this as is that k hat squared has to be less than or equal to the absolute value of two over r delta t. Okay. Um, and and so um, you know how big the, the next question then is how big can k hat squared get? Well, k hat, you know just as we derived uh, uh, usefully uh, last time, k hat squared at maximum. Well, k hat at maximum is two uh, over uh, delta x, right? So k hat squared maximum is four over delta x squared, okay? And that so that comes from the uh, you know just by taking the second difference of a monochromatic wave. Uh, you saw how we did that, and so now we have four over delta x squared has to be less than or equal to the absolute value of two over r delta t, okay? So for heat flow, right? Uh, and this is uh, what will come into uh, your analysis of, uh, or, or that's, this is going to explain what you see in lab seven when you, when you drive the heat flow equation uh, to um, the heat flow finite difference solution to uh, uh, instability. Okay, uh, this is going to be y. Okay, uh, so here we have this is our, our heat flow equation dQ dt is equal to r times e squared q dx squared. Okay. Um, here is um, here is the uh, um, uh, for 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 that right. I mean R is I still leave this in the in the uh, in the form of an absolute value, but you know R is uh, um, let's see. Uh, I, I think R was uh, C over uh, or, or sigma over C, so I think that always has to be positive. But I, I just to be safe. Uh, delta x squared, delta x is always positive. Delta x squared is always positive. Delta t is always positive, right? So um, this inequality I can boil down and solve for, uh, and this is the key, the key part. You know, I want this inequality to be true, right? And how do I arrange that? Well, the easiest thing to arrange is to change the, uh, you know, put a condition on delta t. You know how. Can, you know, if I if I want to evolve a uh, a heat flow system, you know, one D uh, from one day to the next, okay, how do I, uh, you know, can I can I make, you know, the first calculation at, uh, at day zero, and then the very next time step is day two? Can I do that? Okay, or do I have to do it every second? Do I have to make? Do I have to have a time step every second? Do I have to have a time step every hour? You know what? What is it, you know? And if I have to have a time step every second, it's going to take quite a bit longer to find the solution for a day than it is to um, uh, if I have just one time step for one day. Okay. So what determines the time step? Well, it's exactly this st stability criterion, which uh, uh, you know gives you that um, that amplification factor of one. Okay. So you know, usually in, in many problems, your delta x is set. So we put delta x on the right hand side. Your material properties in R they're set. We put that on the right hand side. Okay. What you do have control over as you're arranging the finite difference calculation is, you know, that that delta t. How often do you have to calculate? Uh, you know, how big can your time steps be? And so here's the condition now on delta t. It has to be less than or equal to delta x squared over two times R. And uh, and that uh, yeah and here's uh, uh, putting r into it delta t is less than c delta x squared over two sigma, okay, and and that works just fine. Uh, but of course you know this isn't a class in heat flow, so we got to think about the 15 degree retarded extrapolator, 
Okay, so R instead of being uh, 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 sigma over C, R is uh, minus I times V over two omega, and instead of delta T, we have delta Z. So we need the the magnitude. Uh, of 1 plus i times v delta z k hat squared over 2 omega um, to be less, you know, so this is a, you know, 1 is a real number. Here's an imaginary number, right? Because all of, you know, velocity delta z, omega, k hat, those are all real numbers. So, so this is the imaginary part. We got a complex number here. We take its magnitude. That's got to be less than or equal to 1. Okay. So basically, uh, you know, we take the square root of the quantity one plus, you know, the imaginary part squared, and I forgot to put the square in there on the, on the original, uh, you know, uh, v delta z k hat squared over two omega squared. That has to be, um, and that has to be less than uh, less than one, and and um, so. Uh, uh, do you remember back in, uh, I showed you a few nuggets of, of valuable information in, in the discussion of the uh, parabolic wave equation and the discussion of, uh, of the ray parameter p. Remember that, that p is, um, uh, the slowness is um, k over omega, OK? So we've got k over omega in there. We got, an, we got another k as well. We got delta z. Um, but um, you know the uh, uh, the k o over omega is um, is in uh, the the k over omega you know can can tell us all right you know what are the ray parameters of the ones that will work right so here you know we've already got one there and the only way that we can be less have the sum you know the square root of the sum be less than or equal to one is if this is zero right that that second term there ends up being zero. Uh, delta z can't be zero. That wouldn't be very useful. Uh, we ca we can't use infinite frequency, right? Um, that's that's not going to work. Um, so uh, we're not going to have zero velocity. So the only way uh, for this this term to be zero is if k is zero, or if you want to think about it, the ray parameter is zero. What's the direction of, ray, of wave propagation if the ray parameter is zero? Uh, any, can anybody think? Remember that what that is? Yeah, yeah. So, and, and which means, you know, for, under this uh, exploding reflector model, what, what, uh, what's the dip of the reflector that gives you a vertically propagating reflection? Zero degrees. Zero degrees right. No dip at all. So, so this is not going to be a very useful uh, uh, solution for uh, for a fifteen degree retarded extrapolator because for anything but but uh, flat dips, it's going to blow up. So we're not going to be able to use this to migrate. We could propagate. Uh, we could propagate. You know, waves up and down, with with this. But but yeah, that that's it's just not going to work. Okay. So the extrapolator in the Euler difference, right? That simple difference that I first came out with, is unstable for any you know non-flat waves, and just gets even worse for any dip at all. Okay, so uh, that's our motivation. You know, finally we learned why can't we go with the simple Euler uh, difference? Uh, it, it does work for heat flow, and it's a pretty reasonable uh, condition, right? And you'll you'll exercise this condition in uh, Lab Seven. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you know, for wave extrapolation, it is it is not useful. So that's why uh, we're going to use that Crank-Nicholson implicit finite difference that we had to go and you know solve the tridiagonal equations for and all that, um, the tridiagonal matrix uh, equations. So let's figure out how to uh, look at the stability of the Crank-Nicholson implicit difference. Okay. Um, you can you might remember that. Uh, uh, if you have, uh, you know, just like if you have a, uh, um, if you're looking at, at at the effective spatial frequency, right, uh, from uh, from a second uh, difference, right, you get an estimate of k hat squared. Well, just like that, you know, the uh, the the first time difference has a um, has a Fourier dual. That's what these these arrows are are about. <coughs> These double arrows, 
the Fourier dual of of the uh, of the second difference, right? The Fourier dual of of the time derivative is omega. The Fourier dual of the sec of the first um, time difference, which is q at t plus one minus q at t over delta t, right? The Fourier dual of that we'll call it omega hat. That's our estimated frequency, our estimated time frequency. Okay. So uh, you know, here's our again our, our heat flow equation, which we can convert also to the uh, fifteen degree extrapolation. The Crank Nicholson method is um, uh, is uh, that simple. You know, that first time difference, okay, applied to Q at uh, x um, times uh, these two uh, R times uh, the average between these two. Um, these two spatial differences, right? So we apply the second uh, x difference to q at t plus one, and we apply the second x difference to q at t, the previous time step, and then we average the results. Okay, and and then times r, and and that's uh, uh, you know that that feeds into the time derivative. So, so now, no, notice what I'm doing. These big Ds, they're operators, and so it's a little bit easier to do the algebra now, right? Because I'm, I'm just breaking out the operators, right? There's that second x difference, right? And here I'm explicitly using, you know, I'm breaking out. I want to break out again for a, an amplification factor. I want to break out uh, q at uh, t plus 1 versus uh, uh, q at t, and so i got to use the operator there, OK? Uh, but I can do that pretty easily because all I, all I have to do is transform from x to to k, you know, do the Fourier transform of this equation, and and the Fourier dual of, you know, big D sub x squared is k hat squared, okay, and we know what that is. So there's k hat squared on each side of the equation here. Here's the uh, here's the amplification relationship, okay, q at t plus one over q at t. Is equal to uh, one minus r over two times k hat squared divided by the quantity one plus r over two times k hat squared. Okay, and so for stability, we need uh, uh, the the magnitude, the absolute value of, of g, to be less than or equal to one. And so I make my inequalities again, and I'm going to subtract two from. Uh, well, no, I'm going to clear the um, uh, clear it and. Uh, uh, and make some subtractions. Uh, the inequalities end up pointing the same direction. Um, so I have uh, minus two minus uh, uh, the absolute value of R, the magnitude of r. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm preserving that just in case I want to substitute in the uh, the complex r. Right. Uh, over two uh, times k hat squared is less than or equal to uh, minus, um, and that's absolute value of r there. If you can't read it, over two. Uh, times k hat squared is less than or equal to uh, the absolute value of r over two times k hat squared. Okay, but look at this. I can I can just add absolute value of r over two times k hat squared to all three terms of the inequality, right? And I end up with this inequality: minus two is less than or equal to zero. That's true. No, no it didn't break down, right? <laughs> uh, which is less than or equal to um, to uh, uh, the absolute value of r times k hat squared, uh, but you know no matter what r is, its absolute value is going to be zero or more, and no matter what k hat is, its absolute value is it, or squared is going to be zero or more, right? So so this you know this condition is no condition at all. I mean it's. It's true for any r and any k. You know, there's no problem here. We 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 you know we don't even have to bother to write a condition on on say delta t. It's it's totally irrelevant, right? Um, you know, even if r is this uh, imaginary minus i v over two omega, right? Still works. No, you know, no condition necessary, and and that's why, of course. That's why the uh, Crank Nicholson implicit difference is uh, is the one we use because it's always stable. So yeah, we could we could go straight from you know it's always going to work no matter what the delta x or delta t 
right? With Crank Nicholson, we could go straight from one day to the next in, in calculating the, the temperature through the wall of our refrigerator, right? One time step, boom. So, so really, you know, like in, in wave extrapolation, I mean, we're not gonna we're not gonna jump all the way to the bottom of the section. We want to get the delta z's, you know, in between, right? We want to get the z levels in between. So, you know, we'll we'll let our 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 objectives and our problem and our field survey, you know, that that will determine the delta z we'll use. But we don't have to worry. Any delta z will work. So that 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 makes us a really nice. Um, um, a really nice uh, 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 <clears throat> um, uh, a, a really nice way of, uh, of of handling the finite difference, and, and all we did, right? All we did was change the centering of the finite difference, doing this crazy averaging of the of the uh, x differences, you know, at both t plus one and and uh, and and t. Uh, and that's all we did, and we get totally different uh, uh, stability behavior. Uh, so it's kind of crazy that way. Um, I, I, I'm sure you know now. There's plenty of new, you know uh, of of deep mathematical theory about why why you know certain schemes are stable, but I, it's that's that's kind of beyond me. Um, you know, especially uh, now. Let's let's examine that paraxial extrapolator, right? Where we've got the imaginary R. Right, and two is real. K K hat is real. So so we have uh, the magnitude of one minus i times something, and uh, and we're dividing by the magnitude of one plus i times the same thing. So both of those complex numbers have exactly you know the same magnitude, and so the amplification factor is one. And that's exactly what we want. We want an all-pass filter that's going to move the amplitudes of the waves around. It's going to change the phase, but it's not going to change the amplitude. We don't want to add any amplitude, you know. And, and we're not modeling. Um, we're, we're we're trying hard not to model um, um, uh, uh, intrinsic attenuation or anything that would subtract from amplitude. So this is exactly what we want. We want a paraxial extrapolator that's an all-pass filter, moves the waves around, uh, and and uh, in fact, it's a uh, uh, it's it's not a it's not a minimum phase filter. It's kind of a maximum phase filter, right? Because it's delaying as waves propagate, they get delayed, right? So uh, it's a it's a maximum phase all-pass filter, and and it has a, the amplification factor is always one, and that's exactly what we need. Okay, so another reason why you know we can use Crank Nicholson very, very to very good effect. Okay, so uh, you know Q at z plus one is going to have the same magnitude at Q at z. The the extrapolation is a very gentle process, an all pass filter. All right, now I'm going to skip over the stability of the leapfrog difference. Uh, it's the same um, von Neumann method. But because we have three time levels involved, we got t plus one, we got t minus one, we got t. Uh, we've got to look at the amplification factors both forward and backward in time. Should be the same amplification factor, but but you know it ends up being uh, some pretty unholy uh, stuff. Um, uh, and and maybe maybe it's so complex just because I worked it out myself and I'm you know not the best at reducing things to their uh, simple elements, but. I had to do it to, to make sure that I believed it. And, you know, in, in Ronan Labrasse's paper, uh, you know, from what was it, 1987 in in, um, in geophysics, he said, "Yeah, we showed it stable." So, uh, you know, I, I could have just called up Ronan and, and said, "Hey, uh, can you send me your stability analysis?" You know, he probably would have done it, but I had to prove it. You know, I had to prove that I could do it. So, so that's here. Okay. And we find out that uh, uh, for uh, and, and there's all these cases I have to examine. You know, uh, uh, you know, it gets really complicated. You know, looking at at um, <clears throat> you know uh, uh, products and sums of the uh, of the two uh, values of g you get. Um, so uh, we find out that that 
the material properties and the you know the r delta t k hat squared uh, has got to be zero, and it's only you know for heat flow it's only zero when there's no variation in q with x. So that's crazy, uh, you know. That's that's why the leapfrog uh, blows up. Uh, so you go to all that work, you make a leapfrog solution to the heat flow equation, and then it blows up. It doesn't work for you. So if instead, um, let's see, <clears throat> uh, then you know you can put a uh, after a whole bunch more manipulation, I can put kind of a nasty condition on the uh, stability of the uh, the leapfrog fifteen degree extrapolator. Uh, but that's also not not worth much. Um, so uh, I'm going to go to notes 26 here, and um, uh, just quickly show you the uh, the the stability of the defort Frankel difference, <coughs> which uh, you know it has to be done again another way, right? Um, uh, well, actually, this the DeFort Frankel is the one that I worked out after my my classmate Ronan Lebra also worked it out. Uh, Claire about uh, gives some hints about how to get the stability of the, of the leapfrog, but uh, you know, not very uh, <clears throat> uh, not very complete, which is one reason why it's got my messy work in there. Um, so uh, we can't. Uh, because we change, you know, the, the difficulty with the Dufort Frankel is we can't just change the. Um, uh, let's see, we're on page one twelve now. We can't just change the. Um, uh, we can't just use k hat squared because we've actually changed the definition of the um, uh, of the horizontal derivative, right? By by skipping over that that middle element, right? If you remember the, uh, it's got a star much like the leapfrog, but it doesn't. Doesn't actually use that middle element at all uh, at t and x. Uh, so you know we have to uh, rearrange this and uh, uh, and and you know go back and rederive by plugging in a Fourier mode. Right there's uh, there's the k, and uh, I'll have to uh, have to go to uh, read mode. Okay. So uh, you know we got to go and plug in that uh, that that 4A mode again for arbitrary k, and uh, you know reduce everything and and um, and then try to to you know and then collect a bunch of stuff together into uh, some uh, constants, and then get the forward and backwards uh, um, um, amplification factors g. And uh, solve those with uh, uh, with a quadratic equation, getting you know two values of g, and then we got to check out everything. Uh, this is the only way I could do it anyway, by taking everything to its limits. So maybe maybe it's not quite uh, maybe it's not quite um, uh, uh, it's not quite a complete proof, uh, but you know everything every case I checked out, you know. I got uh, like one over one is less than or equal to one. I got the absolute value of minus one is less than or equal to one. I got uh, plus or the absolute value of plus or minus one is less than or equal to one. And I got uh, you know one plus so the square root of zero is less than or equal to one. Okay. Uh, so this is this is all very nice because uh, you know at least so far as I can tell the Dufort Frankel difference. Not only is it unconditionally stable, just like the, uh, uh, you know, and you can have those day long, uh, uh, um, uh, those day long evolutions of the temperature profile, or or you can extrapolate your uh, your wave field right to the center of the Earth in one step if you want. Okay, um, you know, it's got that convenience of the unconditional stability. Doesn't depend on the material properties. Doesn't depend on the delta z or the delta t or the delta x. Doesn't depend on anything. It's always stable, and the amplification factor is always one. How about that? So this crazy, uh, this crazy, um, uh, you know, recentering scheme, you know, which seems so trivial, 
you know, gives us a, a very nice explicit method, which is uh, which is entirely stable. Okay, so uh, and it's not in the book either. Um, so the labs don't use it, but if you want to use it uh, for, you know, if you want to make a Dufort Frankel version of the heat flow solution um, in lab seven instead of a leapfrog, and and see that it works, uh, you know, I'll give you uh, I'll give you plenty of credit, uh, you know, even if you can't quite make it work, I'll give you plenty of credit for trying. Um,